I'd like to introduce our next speaker. You know, we have a great appreciation for Michael Hatcher. I don't suppose that we could even consider holding a uh, lectureship without having Michael uh, on the uh, speaker's list. I know that uh, every time he's spoken, I have always learned something uh, new, something uh, more instructive. Of course, I know you're thinking, at least for me, that's not much of a stretch. <laughs> And nevertheless, uh, you know, I, I do appreciate his uh, work here and also his, his work for the Bellevue Congregation. He's a dear friend of this congregation, and I hope that he considers us a, a dear friend of the Bellevue Congregation. I think you will find that, uh, uh, that Michael can speak authoritatively on a subject uh, solely from a scholastic standpoint without actually having experienced the subject of which he speaks. He's going to speak to us on the beverage alcohol. That, that is right, right. You don't have to actually experience this, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, you better walk up here steady. <laughs> beverage alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use, uh, please give your kind attention to them and uh, he'll have some very good things uh, instructed to say. It is always a joy to be with you, and it is a joy to have such close association with the spring congregation. I think I missed the first lectureship that was held here, but ever since then I've been here every year, and that is greatly appreciated, the confidence that David and the elders have in me, and we certainly at Bellevue have a close association with this congregation because we know where you stand, and that you will stand for the truth, and that only. <clears throat> According to my uh, clock, we next session is not till 1.30, and so that gives me about two and a half hours to speak on these three subjects. And <laughs> I'm not going to take that long, obviously, but even if I did, we could only touch the hem of the garment. Uh, that's how detailed and how much information there could be given in relationship to subjects such as this. And so as we begin, what I want to do is not deal so much immediately with those things, but to deal with principles that once understood will take care of this, any of these situations that arise. And when we look at those principles, I think the first one that we need to understand, especially as, as Christians, is that of stewardship. When we're dealing with the subject of stewardship, we're dealing with the subject of a recognition, first off, that everything belongs to God. When God created this world, Genesis, the first chapter, as creator, it belongs to him. We are the creation. In the 24th Psalm, in verses 1 and verse 2, it says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. The earth is the Lord's. It belongs to him. And everything within the world belongs to him. In the 50th Psalm, again, he would write uh, in verses 10 through verse 12, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon the thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beast of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. That's God saying, the world belongs to me. Everything that in it is in it belongs to me. But that ownership 
that God has of this world extends to man as well. We belong to him. In the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, and verse 4, we oftentimes use this as a rebuttal to the Calvinistic doctrine of inherited sin. But notice that God says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, so also is the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. All souls, that's you and I. We belong to God. And so as you begin looking at the aspect of stewardship, you have to recognize that everything belongs to God. And that God then gives us those things of which we possess. In First Chronicles 29 and verse 14, he says, But who am I and what is my people? that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort. For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. That's a good principle for us as Christians to learn in relationship to our contribution upon the first day of the week as well. That it belongs to God and we give what is rightfully his but he allows us all things come of thee he gives us those things that we have James would express it in chapter 1 in verse 17 that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning God gives good gifts to us, perfect gifts. It comes from Him. Those, thus, those things which we have here upon this earth, they belong to God, and He is allowing us to use them. That's the principle that we see. A steward is to be faithful in using that which his owner possesses. If you go back to the idea of stewardship, that's the idea that you see. Here is, in that time, a slave that would be put in charge of his owner's possessions. And that slave was to make sure that those things were used properly and rightly. That's the idea of stewardship. That's what you and I are. God owns it. We are to use it and make sure that everything that he has given unto us and that he allows us to use is used properly. That includes our own bodies, our souls. In Isaiah 43 and verse 1, Isaiah writes, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. There's God's claim upon us. And he sets forth three ideas for our consideration as far as God's claim upon us. The first is by right of creation. He created thee. Form thee. Second, he has a right or a claim upon us by right of redemption. I have redeemed thee. And thus, as we have been saved, we have been redeemed, we belong to him. He has a claim upon us. And thir- third, I have called thee by thy name. That idea possesses the idea of providence. I called you. I have provided for you. And thus, in these three areas, God sets forth the right that He has over us. No wonder as we come to 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verses 19 and verse 20. 
He would say, what, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirits, which are God's. We thus, belonging to God, yes, by right of creation, by right of redemption, by right of providence, God's claim upon us, we belong to Him, we are to be faithful in that stewardship that God has allowed us to use in relationship to our bodies. A second area of principle that will apply to all three of these areas is the idea of sober-mindedness or being sober. The scriptures continually urge us to sober-mindedness. In Titus, the second chapter, Paul is telling Titus to instruct certain ones to teach others. And he says that the older women are to teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. He says, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. And so again, Both older women are to teach younger women to be sober. Young men are to be taught to be sober-minded. There is the same idea that is being expressed in both of those words, though. In Titus, the second chapter, in verse 11, Paul talks about, Here's the grace of God that bringeth salvation. It hath appeared unto all men. Teaching us, it teaches us three things. It teaches us first to deny, second it teaches us to live, and third it teaches us to look in verses 12 and 13. In that teaching us to deny, we are to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. In that area of teaching us to live, we are to live soberly, righteously, and godly. And then in that third area of looking, we are to look for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. But there's that aspect, we are too, and here's the grace of God that teaches us to live soberly. Sober-mindedness. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, in verse 13, Peter would say, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope unto the end of the grace that is to be brought into the, to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Later on in the, in the book, chapter 5 and verse 8, he again encourages us, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Well, here's the reason, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan is going around like a roaring lion. He's just waiting to pounce on us and to destroy us. And in order to prevent that destruction, we have to be sober-minded. Soberness and vigilant, watchful, ever watchful, because Satan's out there and we know that so well. All we have to do is look at our society. But when you're dealing with soberness, the word that's translated, there are various words, but they all go back to the idea of a soundness of mind. Or being able to reason correctly. It includes someone who has self-control or is temperate. Controlling self. Now then, it includes not limited to this, but it certainly includes the control of the passions and desires enabling us to be conformed to the mind of Christ. Remember Philippians 2 and verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. The only way we can have the mind of Christ, or if you want a second... Uh, Peter, the first chapter, verse 3 and 4, that we are to, by God's divine power, He has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. 
Why? So that we can develop the divine likeness within us. If we're going to be like Christ, like God within our life, then we're going to have to be able to think soberly. We're going to have to be able to control ourselves and our passions and our desires to conform ourselves to God's will. It also would include the idea of being of thinking of oneself moderately and reasonably. And then having the the ability to make wise decisions. That's the idea of sober-mindedness that is set forth for us so many times within the scriptures. But then there's another principle that I think that applies to much of this, and that is the area of habits. There are many things that are addictive in nature. Christians, in exercising self-control or temperance, are not going to allow themselves to come under the control of those types of things, whatever it might be. Of course, Paul reasoned with Felix of righteousness, that's right living, temperance, that's self-control. Of course, Felix was a man historically that had no self-control within his life, and judgment to come. And we know Felix's response, he trembled. But he still was not obedient to the gospel of Christ and sent Paul away saying, when I have a convenient season, I'll call for you. Temperance or self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 and verse 23, that meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Addictions, by their very nature, take away the control that we are to exercise over ourselves. Addictions place us under the control of the addiction, whatever it is that we are addicted to, instead of being able to exercise that self-control. Now, the Christian is one who exercises self-control, but that self-control is under the control of God. The Christian would never place himself in a situation where that control of God is superseded by some other action or whatever it might be. Because the Christian is going to be under the control of God first and foremost within his life. And when we allow something else to come into our mind and take control of our mind and our bodies, then we have lost that self-control and we're no longer putting God first within our life. That's the nature of habits, though. And while it might not does not refer to sinful actions. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12. All things are lawful unto me. Thus he's not dealing specifically with sinful actions. But would it include that? Well, we'll see. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but now and thus. I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, that's even of things that are lawful, certainly sinful actions. We should never be brought under the power of those sinful actions. Now then, the application of those three basic principles that I think we all generally recognize, first in relationship with the drug use, And in talking about drug use, there is no safe drug. Now that may surprise some individuals, but there is no safe drug. Uh, Just a personal comment in relationship to that. 
Many of you know that my wife has Crohn's disease. I have been trying to get her for years to get on to Remicade or Humira, and she has steadfastly refused until shortly, not too long ago. She went to her doctor and started talking about, well, you know, it, these are dangerous drugs, and you, if you see any of the advertisements, you start hearing all of this list of possible side effects. And so she asked, is it safe? And the doctor's response, there is no safe drug. Not what I wish she had said at that time, but... Then she said, but the drugs that you're already on to control, try to control this are no more dangerous than this. And so she got on it finally. It's helped. and cured it, but it does help. There is no safe drug. All of them have side effects. The very purpose of a drug is to affect either the body or the mind. Thus, in regards to that, there is no safe drug. But some individuals want to stop there. And they get all paranoid. Why, well, you can't use drugs then. Or you can't use this or that. Instead of allowing the Bible to continue on, why, well, no, there's no safe drug. Yet there are safe ways in using those drugs. And not only are there safe ways in using them, they are necessary and good and useful. The Bible authorizes them. But to use them in an improper way, at the wrong time or the wrong amount, yes, is dangerous, no matter what the drug is going to be. But the Bible does use, speak of medicine and the medicinal use of drugs. For example, Isaiah 1 and verse 6 says, From the sole of the feet, foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been clothed, ne uh, closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. The idea of ointment there is the use of oil for me medicinal purposes. When we read of the Good Samaritan, do we forget that the Good Samaritan, upon coming to this man who had been beaten and robbed, he had compassion on him? And do we stop there or do we also recognize he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an end uh, and took care of him? What was he doing? He was using oil and wine as me medicine in relationship to his wounds. And Jesus says, now here's an example of someone who is acting in a good way, a God-authorized way. In Jeremiah the 8th chapter and verse 22, says, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? There is a balm there. There is something to cure them there. There is a physician who can use the proper medication to heal the people. In Matthew or Mark the 15th chapter. As Jesus was upon the cross, it says that they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh. And it says he received it not. But that's what they were using to kill the pain in relationship to that individual hanging upon the cross. And while Jesus did not receive it at that time, doesn't mean that it's wrong to use painkillers and those medicines that would kill the pain. It's just that in relationship to Jesus and the cross, he was going to suffer that which the Father had intended. 
And so he refused the pain-killing medicine at that time. Then one that the alcoholics love to run to, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23 where Paul tells Timothy to drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine off infirmities. And the alcoholics will throw up the... See, there it is. We have the right to drink. has absolutely nothing to do with that. It has everything to, to do with the proper taking of medication. And we'll come back to this and as we talk about alcohol. But just suffice it at this time, Paul is commanding Timothy to use the proper medication of the day in order to take care of his stomach, his ailments. He needed the medication. But brethren, there is a world of difference between medicinal use of drugs and the recreational use of drugs. Those two should never be confused. And when we're talking about drug use, yes, drug use, they can be good if used properly. But what if we abuse them? Then it's wrong. What if they are illegal? We are to obey the laws of the land, aren't we? That takes care of those illegal drugs. Oh, but this drug, it's not as bad as this. So what? It's illegal, isn't it? And do you hear what you're saying? It's not as bad? You mean it's bad. It just might not be as bad as something else, but it's still bad, isn't it? Now, and how many times have we heard that about smoking marijuana? It's not as bad as this or that. Still means it's bad. But those illegal drugs, by the very nature of the fact that they're illegal, makes them sinful. What about legal drugs, though? You can classify legal drugs from the standpoint of useful and abuse. We can abuse that which is good. People have back pain, and so what do they do? They go to the doctor and get Oxycontin or whatever those uh, oxy ones are, all of that group of drugs, and they start taking them. And taking more and more. And they become hooked on those drugs. They have become abusers of that which was good and profitable at one time, but now then because of their abuse of it, not the proper use, it has become wrong. How many have we seen because of emotional disturbances Go to the doctor and get this medication or that medication, and they start taking more and more of it, and they can't get through the day without it. Why? Because they've started abusing it instead of properly using it. And thus, the abuse of those medications, even prescription drugs, is wrong. It takes away from those areas that we just talked about in sober-mindedness, habit-forming. We have to be careful, yes, about habit-forming drugs that might be prescribed by a physician so that we do not end up abusing them and coming under their power. But then there's alcohol. Alcohol is a drug. It is classified as a depressant. In other words, it slows down vital functions. 
Sometimes, and if Terry Hightower were here, we could say we wish it would slow down his mouth sometimes, but um, he's not here, so we won't say that. But it slows down the body. It slows down the mind. It affects every organ in the, bo in the body. Its effect upon the mind, actually that's what it affects first as we drink, is to reduce or to suppress or depress a person's ability to think rationally. It distorts an individual's judgment, thus loosening that individual's inhibitions. Think about what we said previously in relationship to soundness of mind. We have to be of sound mind, being able to reason correctly in order to avoid the pitfalls that Satan is there placing in our ways so that he can devour us. What does alcohol do? It reduces the ability to think rationally. And because of that, sometimes it's thought of as a stimulant, that it stimulates people to do things that they would not ordinarily do. Why? Because in reality, it has reduced their inhibitions. It has depressed their reasoning capability, the reasoning capability that would have prevented them from doing that sinful action if they had not been drinking. But that's what alcohol does. Alcohol, as we mentioned, can be used properly for medicinal purposes. And we read, mentioned 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23. If you look at a lot of the cough syrups that you can buy over the counter, a lot of them contain alcohol. It serves a function in medicine many times to disseminate the drugs that are in the, the medicine more effectively. It can be used in a proper way even today. But that's medicinal purposes. There is no Bible authority for drinking recreationally. We call it today in our society social drinking. You cannot find Bible authority for such. In fact, drunkenness is specifically condemned. We could all go to the scriptures, Romans 13, 13, that we are to walk on honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness and so forth. We know that drunkenness is a work of the flesh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. 1 Peter 4, verse 3 and following, that here's the ways of the Gentiles, and part of that is, yes, excess of wine, drunkenness. There's the drunkenness. And people thus will say, well, see, drunkenness is condemned in the Bible, but if I just have a little bit of drinking and I don't get drunk, then it's all right. One time on one of these Facebook groups as this discussion was raging as to whether or not it was sin to drink at all, social drinking, I put on what Solomon stated and used a little bit of ridicule because Solomon wrote in the 23rd Psalm in verse 31, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. When it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. So I just facetiously said, it's all right to drink as long as you close your eyes then. As long as you don't see it, it's all right. <laughs> well, how foolish. Don't even look upon it. Now, does that mean you have to close your eyes when you drink? Of course not. It means you stay away from it. Totally. Don't drink at all. 
In Ephesians 5 and verse 18, Paul says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The word that's translated drunk there is an inceptive verb. It's also called an ingressive or incohative verb. It deals with the beginning of a process. Here with the negative, not to begin the process. And thus he is saying, do not begin the process of being drunk with wine. Question, how does one begin the process of being drunk? Really, we shouldn't even have to answer, but for some people, it's necessary. When you take the first drink, you start the process. And if you never take the first drink, you will never get drunk. But when you take that first drink, you are to that extent drunk. The idea of one drink drunk. And for time's sake, I'm not going to go into that in detail, setting forth the nature of it. But it is the truth that when you take your first drink, you are to that extent drunk. But let me also bring up another aspect. We talk about one drink drunk oftentimes. But when you take your first drink, you are to that extent less sober. And that's is what God says, you are to be sober-minded. And that first drink takes away from that sober-mindedness. I said we would come back to Timothy and his being commanded by Paul and thus by God to take a little wine for his stomach's sake, use it medicinally. I think that's interesting Because it shows us that Timothy would not even use alcohol in a medicinal way. Are we to think that he would have used it in a recreational way, but he would not have used it medicinally? It shows us that Timothy was a total teetotaler. And he refused even the medicinal use until it was command of God. Timothy, you need to do this. Otherwise, he would not have even used it medicinally. Now, tobacco. Is there really anyone who does not know that tobacco is harmful? If we don't know that, then we're really in pretty bad shape. Just read on the side of every cigarette pack and you can determine it's harmful. Do we really not understand through all of the studies that have been made that the evidence is overwhelming, that not only smoking harms the individual, but secondhand smoke harms other people? Do we not know how addictive... Cigarette smoking is, if you watch television for any length of time, you're going to see advertisements to try and help people get off of tobacco. It's very addictive. The influence that one has is certainly reduced as a result of smoking cigarettes. And so we, uh, that's just something that never should begin. Also, smokeless tobacco, chewing tobacco, it's also harmful. Maybe not as harmful as smoking it, but it's still harmful. It's still bad. Again, should be wary of such. But there's a new thing that's out now, vaporizers e-cigarettes, and such like. A word of warning about that. There have not been the proper studies done to really determine how safe those things are. Why should we go into and start using them? They do contain nicotine. 
They do not contain many of the other byproducts in cigarettes, but they do contain nicotine. And it is harmful as well. It is a drug. It, some of them do contain other dangerous ad- additives. Plus, there is an unknown risk of inhaling aerosol that is generated in such manner. Are they safer than cigarettes? Probably. Notice I said probably because the proper studies have not been concluded yet as to whether they are or not. But they probably are. But they can be just as habit-forming as the cigarettes. And they can also become a gateway to actual smoking of cigarettes. Why don't we avoid them instead? We as Christians are to be a shining light in a world of darkness. Through an improper use of drugs, alcohol, tobacco, those activities, we're not going to be a shining light. We have allowed Satan to come in and take control. We must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and then be obedient to him, setting forth a lifestyle that will be exemplary among the world. And so as people see us, would they see someone, if they saw Jesus, you think you'd see someone smoking a cigarette or going over and drinking alcohol? We don't have time to deal with John 2. It was an alcohol. It was grape juice that Jesus made, and if you want to discuss it, we can discuss it. He wouldn't be engaged in those things. Neither should we. If we want to be the type of individuals that God wants us to be. And if we want to be able to be used for the service of God. If you're not a Christian this morning, upon your faith, repent of your sins. That's turning away from things, yes, things that we've discussed this morning. And all sin to turn to God. Make a confession of your faith in Jesus Christ. Let us baptize you in water for the forgiveness of your sins. If you've gone back into sin, no longer living the type of life that God wants you to live, why not repent this morning and come back into Him? And once again, start living that type of life that God wants you to live and being that shining example in the world of darkness. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.